has all its naughty bits hung out on the front. Some people say it's a sort of religion. You're very luckily and privileged to own one. They were built like bathtubs on wheels. You have got a delightful habit of stopping on you. And it goes like, like the clappers. Ah! Well, my grandfather, HFS Morgan, was the son of a rector in Herefordshire. But he had very much an engineering bent, and he, in fact, went to Swindon to the Great Western Railway to train as a railway engineer, and uh, then came back to Malvern and ran a bus company. And the challenge in those days, really, was um, getting over the Malvern Hills, which he had to do on a regular basis to get back to Herefordshire, where his father, the rector, lived. And uh, he thought he could build a vehicle that was uh, capable of going up and down the hills better than anybody else, and he did that. My father had the great advantage of being both an engineer and a businessman, which really was very unusual because you get a lot of clever engineers, but when it comes to business and marketing, what they make and what they, they can produce and design, uh, it doesn't always work out. Well, I was nine, uh, unfortunately, when he died, um, but I did know him quite well. And I knew him as a hugely inventive, very funny, very, very warm character who really looked after me. Um, so it's personal memories I've got. I mean, he used to give me a new dinky every time I went to stay with him, which I thought was particularly generous. And um, he made toys as well. He made a pedal car from scratch. Um, and um, I think he, his real interest was in designing and making things. The first Morgan three-wheeler was a very simple design, but it had some great features to it. Perhaps the main one was power-to-weight ratio. Um, he actually got an engine from Peugeot, uh, which wasn't that powerful, but he made the car as light as he possibly could, uh, even to the extent of having rather clever devices like the chassis tubes carried the exhaust system. Um, he then put the engine in front of the two wheels, and he put himself behind the two wheels, so all the weight was balanced over those two wheels. And not only that, the two wheels in 1909 had independent suspension. So it rode beautifully over the bumps. Because it was a single seater, it didn't really catch on. But he had a lot of people come up to him and say, make that a two seater. And, you know, it'll be a real success. And so that's exactly what he did. In 1910, he took the two seater version to Olympia. I think he got about 60 orders uh, in the first day of the show. And Mr. Burbage of Harrods, who was the managing director of Harrods at the time, said, I've got to have that in my shop window. And it's, I think, the only car ever to have been in the shop window of Harrods. My present three-wheeler is a 1928 Aero Super Sports. And it has a Blackburn engine, 1096 water-cooled engine, and two speeds. It has um, virtually no suspension, um, rather fewer wheels than many people would expect. Um, it has all its naughty bits hung out on the front, which isn't usual. It appeals to people very often who've ridden motorcycles, and everybody looks at them and thinks, wow, what on earth is that? A very simple construction, uh, which was very effective. I mean, they were sort of virtually put together with, by blacksmiths, and uh, certainly there was nothing a blacksmith couldn't mend. And uh, they went ever so well, and uh, Henry Morgan um, did a lot of trials and reliability trials in the early days, and uh, it, uh, I think it really sort of came to fruition when uh, the Morgan won the Amiens Cycle Car Grand Prix in 1914, and that was, that was it. That was when it really took off. And after that, of course, the successes at Brooklands of the three-wheeler um, almost meant that it was too good for its particular classification. So much so that, in fact, it was asked to start in the 1100cc class, the lap behind the equivalent cars. Um, and they did, in fact, ban three-wheelers from Brooklands in 1922, ostensibly because there was an accident at the chicane. 
but everybody secretly thinks that it was because they were a bit too fast and they were winning all the races. I, I used to race um, when I had more Sundays off, uh, or I could get more Sundays off, and I had a, an F-Type then, which had a, uh, the four-cylinder Ford engine. And, of course, that was expendable, but the present one I haven't raced because the engine isn't expendable. It's, a, it's a, quite an unusual engine, and uh, um, if I blew it up, I'd be really stuck, I think. Some people wouldn't think that a Morgan three-wheeler was beautiful. I mean, they were built like... Um, bathtubs on wheels and uh, they looked really, I mean, totally style-less, but, but they had a sort of integrated feel about them. I suppose the character of the thing, which is very direct and uh, you're close to the ground, uh, the wind's rushing through your hair, but you've also got to like a bit of pain as well when it's raining or when it's snowing. Um, you've got to be able to keep up with the maintenance, so you've got to be a fiddle, you know, person who sort of fiddles around with things and prepared, prepared to get dirty fingernails. Uh, it's quite a job sometimes getting ready for communion on Sunday morning. But... Well, the three-wheeler Morgan had its heyday in the, after the First World War and in the early 20s. And at that time, the factory was pushing out 40 to 50 cars a week which makes our current production look rather lame in comparison. But it was affordable, it was sporting, and uh, it uh, benefited from quite cheap taxation as well. Having only three wheels gave it a huge advantage over the four-wheeler in terms of road tax at the time. If I looked at the, the essence of Morganeering from a religious perspective, I'd say it's sort of like being uh, uh, David and Goliath sort of thing. That you, you, There you are in a, a very small and... Uh, improbable looking car and uh, it'll do what an awful lot of cars much bigger and much more expensive won't do and I think that was always the case. Um, they go like the clappers, they handle really well and they're sort of so individual. During the 30s the three-wheeler went slowly out of favour. I think part of the reason for this was because obviously four-wheelers were being manufactured in mass production plants. But also, of course, people's expectations of comfort went up enormously. And as a result, my grandfather, I think, realized that the twin, sporting as it was, probably needed a bit more comfort. And to that end, he ended up building the last line of three-wheelers, which were the F-types. This is a 1935 Morgan F4 uses the Ford 1172cc 10 horsepower engine. The handling is, is not so good as on the twin cylinder ones, uh, mainly because the weight distribution is different, having the engine behind the axle line rather than ahead of the axle line and a longer wheelbase. So although low performance is, is good compared with a lot of cars, the general handling I never feel is, is as good as on the two cylinder sports models. Uh, having doors doesn't help, makes the whole car more flexible and uh, Nothing with doors is, is as good as one without doors. It was a good seller in the 1930s. Uh, brought in some new customers who thought it was more car-like and perhaps a little bit more manageable for the average driver. Three wheels are enough because they don't fall over. Uh, you've got to try pretty hard to turn a Morgan over. Um, some people have managed it, but general road manners of the three wheeling are very good. I had the first Morgan in 1960, the 1928 family model, and uh, that needed a lot of spares, so we found another one which the chap wanted to swap for a shotgun, but I paid him £10 instead of a shotgun. And uh, we dragged that home. But that was a different model, so that didn't really provide spares for the family model. So we then needed spares for two Morgans. So 
We then acquired another one that was spares for one of the others, but that was different again. So we finished up with three Morgans all needing spares. And that's how the collection really got started, was um, dragging home piles of wreckage and uh, eventually restoring them over the last 35 years. Just get hooked on Morgans and that's it, really. I, I don't know, I just keep, just got to keep doing them. Some people say it's a sort of religion. you just got to keep rebuilding Morgans. And if, if you don't rebuild another one, you take one apart and start again. I think my grandfather realised that even with the new F-Type three-wheeler, the days of the three-wheeler were a bit numbered. And he'd always wanted to do a four-wheeler. In fact, he'd done a, a tubular chassis four-wheeler back in 1914. But he, in fact, ended up basing the first Morgan four-wheeler on the F-Type series. So it had the Z-section chassis. And that, of course, was the Morgan 4.4 of 1936 with the Coventry Climax engine. The car is a 1938 Morgan 4.4 Series 1 coupe. And between 1938 and the outbreak of the war, around about 50 were built. And although some people used them in competition, for the most part, they were really used as a much more sedate country doctor's motor car or something like that. The cable brakes um, are entertaining because you rely obviously on the friction but sometimes the friction will stay on one side, so the next time you apply the brakes, you're pulling to the left, and the time after that, you pull to the right. They have got a delightful habit of um, stopping on you, simply because they get so hot sometimes that the fuel evaporates. The people who have an interest in the very early 4.4s, whether it's a coupe or a roadster, um, are probably the sort of people that also like taking cold showers. Someone once said that everything on a Morgan is adjustable and therefore it's always in a state of being adjusted. Um, there's no getting away from it. it. It is not always an easy matter to get the car from A to B over a long distance. You have got to accept the fact that something w might well go wrong. But perhaps that's all part of the charm of it. I mean, this is 1930s motoring. This is not 1990s motoring. I'm afraid to say that any young lady who expects to turn up um, in her latest fashionable clothes, um, looking neat and tidy after a damn good shower of rain, she's certainly going to hate the car. There's no getting away from it. I mean, this particular model um, is one of the prettiest cars that Morgan Factory have ever produced. Originally, the car was restored um, very much with um, gloss, glamour, um, and prestige in mind. But then one weekend, I saw an advert for a club trial, and I had absolutely no idea what a club trial was. And I went along, and I saw these chaps driving in and out of trees, and it seemed an awful lot of fun. Went and joined them, and never looked back. The Morgan Plus 4 was introduced in 51, 1951, and it originally had the Vanguard engine, but uh, latterly it had the Triumph engine. But right from the start, it gave the four-wheeler Morgan a lot of torque and quite a bit of extra power. So it was successful, particularly in rallies at the start, and latterly some quite interesting international competition, with particularly Chris Lawrence running at Le Mans in 1962 and winning the two-litre class against the Porsches. My father, Peter Morgan, used to regularly do the RAC rally as well as the, uh, the other major international rallies at the time. Competition is always important, but I personally am not convinced whether competition with some vehicle which doesn't resemble, resemble your road car or the car that people buy at all means very much. Um, personally, I don't, it doesn't mean much to me. And uh, unless one can compete with a car that the public could say, gosh, that's, that's like mine, you know, I, 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 I've got one of those. Um, that, uh, that's what is necessary, I think. And in America, in SCCA racing, 
Uh, a man called Lee Spencer completely dominated the two-liter class with a Morgan, which uh, he called Baby Doll. It was Baby Doll 1, Baby Doll 2, Baby Doll 3, and Baby Doll 4. But uh, they regularly saw off all the op opposition in sports car racing in America and led, in fact, to an enormous following for the plus four. I think at the end of the 60s, a lot of the sports car manufacturers were taking different directions. Um, some people had seen in the American market, for example, that people wanted a slightly softer, more comfortable car. So things like winding windows, dare I say, and electric windows even, were beginning to be uh, asked for. We, we, we were doing quite well with the um, uh, plus four, but of course things changed, and, and uh, we were no longer able to get the four-cylinder TR engine, which uh, we used. Uh, with the constant, we had to look out for uh, another unit, and it just happened that the um, Rover engine that was offered to me um, was highly suitable for the car. The Plus Eight introduced in 1968. The performance was fairly shattering. I remember the um, motor and auto car figures being um, something like 0 to 70 in seven seconds, which for those days was quite quick. Morgan, not surprisingly, in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, were marketed as simple, straightforward sports cars. They weren't unlike, visually, the MGs and the HRGs of the period. However, when we get to the 60s, particularly with the launch of the Plus 8, you get a complete change. Morgan became a fashion accessory. Their sales material and their literature garishly coloured no reference to tradition, no reference to pedigree, and indeed by buying a Morgan, you were probably suggesting at that time that you were buying something, yes, unusual, but you were buying something that was rather up-to-date, um, rather high fashion. The Plus 8 is the flagship model, you understand. It's far gruntier than the lesser type, the 4-4 the four or the Plus 4, um, my opinion of a sports car is yes, it is one that you can drive to the shops, drive to the office, drive down the pub, and yet that weekend you can, with minor modification, rattle it around the racetrack at vast velocity and have fun from it. And when you think of the history of Morgan cars, it was founded upon competitive success. In the early days, members of the family would have uh, been sent out on a on a Friday night with instructions to go and win trophies over the weekend and not to bother coming in again on Monday if they hadn't done so, you understand. I've raced now for about 10 years. I'm not a very competitive racer, you understand. I do it for the fun of it, and it's not fun if you scare yourself witless or whateverless. I'm a gentleman racer. I do it for a bit of adrenaline flow and going at speed in my, in my car. Sadly, uh, last August at um, Silverstone, it suffered the attentions of an AC Cobra on the rear end, which did it terminal damage. I had to totally rebuild it, which I finished four o'clock in the morning a week ago today. Jumped in it, drove it down to Dover, over to Belgium and raced around the circuit at Spa. Came back after the weekend, it didn't miss a beat, drove perfectly. In the 80s and 90s, the nostalgia boom in so many areas, including motoring, obviously affected Morgan who presented their cars in catalogues that actually looked as if they were 50s catalogues. The cars inside are featured against 1930s petrol stations, 1930s petrol pumps, and every attempt was made in the 80s and 90s to suggest that by buying a Morgan, you were re-entering that particularly exciting world of motoring of the 30s. You were going to be driving on empty roads, and you were going to be going to deserted country pubs. I think Morgans are very special. Um, as you probably know, you have to wait six or seven years for one to be built for you. It isn't as though you can go and buy one from the showroom tomorrow. It's built with your name. As it goes around the factory, there's a label attached. It has your name on it. That's a very nice touch. Um, they are very special. There are only possibly 200 or so a year built for the home market. So you're very lucky and privileged to, to own one.
people often ask me, who styled the Morgan? I say, well, nobody, it just evolved. And I remember talking to a, a guy called Freddie James, and he was describing how after the war, when he'd ceased to be a Morgan agent, he was just visiting the works, and they were there in the, uh, in the drawing office, which was a wall in the, uh, some part of the works, and they were trying to decide how to make the, the headlights fit into the four-wheelers. And so he got a bit of chalk and drew on the wall, and that design was incorporated, and that became the, the headlights for the four-wheelers. The styling of the Morgan appeals particularly to children. Now, they're people who have no preconceptions of what a car should look like. You can see where the engine is. You can see where the wheels are. You can see where the driver sits. You can even see the spare wheel on the back of it. There's no such thing as a, a totally new Morgan in the sense that uh, there are so many design features and techniques that are held in common with the very er earliest ones. And for example, the, the sliding pillar front suspension um, was there in 1909, original patent, and that's still there today. The wooden body frame and metal panelling is there, and certainly the feel of it, like sort of so it's like a sort of glorified roller skate, really, um, with uh, very hard suspension. It just sort of feels very much the same as, as they always did. So, yeah, the Morgan character has lived on right from the word go. But we've tried changing the design. My father brought out the Plus 4 Plus in 1963, and it was a much more conventional two-seater closed coupe and fiberglass. And it didn't catch on, but it led to an enormous resurgence in demand for the existing um, open to see I must say, even myself, I've seen a car a long way away come forward to me, and I, I, I thought, well, that looks rather good looking, you know. And bully, bully, when it comes by, it's a Morgan. <laughs> and and uh, really, I have thought that quite genuinely. To continue making them is definitely a tribute to my father. I think you'd be quite satisfied and rather pleased and, and probably amazed. I don't think you'd believe it. <laughs> it is, I would suggest, a genuine classic vehicle, unlike others nowadays that have produced that, that attempt to recreate this, this um, appeal, but have fallen short. This is the genuine item. And it goes like, like the clappers. Ah!